All right, everyone. Welcome to Cooperism 713. I'd like to start with a passage from Simone Biles' Reflections on the Causes of Liberty and Social Oppression, which, of course, she considered uh, to be her grand oeuvre, uh, her magnum opus, written in 1934, just polished off just before she would go work in the factory in Paris. The only possibility of salvation would consist in the methodical cooperation of all, powerful and weak, with a view to the progressive decentralization of social life. That was a powerful, a powerful message about cooperation. Um, but it was in 1934. Uh, Hitler was on the rise in Germany. France was in economic conditions were depression, post-depression. Fascism was on the rise in Spain. And the political and geopolitical were in crises, like today. And in such a political climate with war raging, it's hard even to talk about cooperation. It's certainly hard to talk about cooperation today. It was back then hard to talk about cooperation as well. Simone Weil felt that way the same way many of us feel today. And so following that strong embrace of cooperation as the only way forward, she writes, but the absurdity of such an idea is immediately obvious. Such cooperation cannot even be dreamt of in a civilization based on rivalry, struggle, and war. And yet, of course, she says, without such cooperation, it's impossible to halt the blind tendency of the social machine towards increasing centralization. That was Simone Weil's predicament. I'd say it's ours as well. How is it even possible to talk about cooperation when we're surrounded by so much hate, by so much violence, and by war? Well, I think in our seminar series, we're kind of turning that question upside down, inside out. Because the real question is, how can you ever possibly imagine ending hate, violence, and yes, war without cooperation? And that, I think, is the real dilemma and the correct way to think about it. Cooperation can only be the only way forward. So tonight we think about cooperation with Simone Weil, and we think about it with her unique philosophical method, a method that consisted of a constant confrontation of critique and praxis. She placed her own experiential practice at the very core of her distinctive way of philosophizing. While refused to theorize problems without having engaged them practically, without actually throwing herself at the risk of her own peril into the milieu about which she was reflecting. She was in fact more than just a, and it's not a just, but she was more than a engaged philosopher. We often think of, we, we actually, a few years ago, we studied in part Sartre uh, with Etienne Benibar as the epitome of the engaged philosopher, right? And Sartre was surely engaged. Um, at his own risk, often at risk of arrest, as when he took over La Cause du Peuple, which was outlawed, uh, the organ of the uh, gauche proletarian, um, or or when he was the, the lead prosecutor in the prosecutions of the, the mining industry in Lens. Um, he was relentless in his political engagement, but somehow Simone Weil in, took engagement to another level. Troubled by the living conditions of factory workers, she requested a leave of absence from teaching and went into the factory to work uh, for almost six months in 1934-35, um, working at the Alstom plant uh, in the southern part of Paris and then the Renault plant. Later, distressed by the rise of fascism in Spain, uh, she volunteered to fight along the uh, alongside the anarcho-syndicalists in Aragon and Catalonia, 
and um, headed off to Spain herself in August 1936, uh, only weeks after Franco's coup. And of course, distressed equally by the rise of Hitler and Nazism, while enlisted in General de Gaulle's Free French Forces. She had uh, escaped uh, France, escaped Marseille and come to New York. Um, well discussed in, uh, in, Ben's, in Ben's book, which we'll introduce in a second, and, uh, and, and left New York City and as a matter of fact, is living right here in uh, in Morningside Heights, up on about 120 near near Pasticci's restaurant, um, up there, uh, on Riverside Drive, and went to London to work uh, for De Gaulle's uh, team. Uh, and actually, when she was there, she became frustrated that she wasn't doing enough and wanted to actually go back to Europe back to France and join the resistance. Tragically, she died a few months later, uh, not having reached France. But it's clear that she had a particular commitment to putting her life on the line for her ideas, um, and that she wouldn't allow herself to think through these things without somehow experiencing them firsthand. For her, theory was inextricably linked to praxis, and it offered this unique insight into the world. It's a method I would call maybe something like immersive philosophical praxis, right? And the immersion is important here. And it's something that for me uh, serves as a model, an exemplar, immersive philosophical praxis. In this seminar, we're going to explore Simone Weil's philosophical writings and praxis in relation to these questions about cooperation and collectivities. Because I believe that her immersive philosophical praxis provides tools to address questions of cooperation, even if I don't always agree with where she landed on particular points. And so the questions we're going to pose is what resources and tools, both theoretical and practical, does Simone Weil offer to approach cooperation more productively? How does her philosophy and the way that she led her life help forge a path forward towards cooperatives? And to help address these questions, we are privileged uh, and honored to welcome two brilliant critical thinkers, both experts on Simone Weil's political philosophy. Uh, we're gonna hear first from Benjamin Davis, uh, who joins us from St. Louis University. And he's the author most recently of the book that you all have been reading for this seminar, Simone Weil's Political Philosophy, Field Notes from the Margins, which was just published uh, this year at Roman and Little Theater. Um, and as you know from this text, Ben has an extraordinary way of relating both the theoretical and the praxis of Simone Weil to contemporary issues. Uh, to to the problems that we care about today. Um, he really has a remarkable way of giving life to these critical thinkers. These, the, the, other, um, the other book that he also published this year, remarkably, is Choose Your Bearing, Edward Guisson, Human Rights and Decolonial Ethics. Um, we had a marvelous uh, session on that at noon today with uh, Professor uh, Bashir Tiang. And um, so, uh, so this is going to be very exciting. Um, and then after Ben Davis presents, we're going to hear from Professor Frida Ecoto. Uh, and thank you for joining us. Um, Frida Ecoto is the Lorna Goodison Collegiate Professor of Afro-American and African Studies, Comparative Literature and Francophone Studies at the University of Michigan. Uh, Professor Ecoto is a philosopher. Uh, as well as an intellectual historian, and she's the author of several books, including Race and Sex Across the French Atlantic and L'Écriture Carcérale, this particular book for our, for our community here. Uh, L'Écriture Carcérale et le Discours Juridique, Jean Genet, so uh, a Carceral Writing and Juridical Discourse, uh, a book on Jean Genet, 2001. And, um, and Professor Ecoto is also the president of the Modern Language Association this year, so very busy. Um, and I couldn't dream of a better panel to explore Simone Biles' writings on cooperation 
So the way we're going to do it is Ben Davis will start uh, and then Frida Ecoto, and then I'll actually make a little presentation myself on some of the factory writings, which I find so compelling. So um, welcome to Cooperation 713, Cooperism 713, and Ben, let's take it away. Thanks, Bernard, uh, for that introduction and your hospitality. I also want to thank uh, Kiana. And it's always an honor to be uh, in conversation with Frida. Um, before I begin, I just want to say I have followed the series for a while. I think first was uh, Critique 713 with Martin Saar on Adorno and Negative Dialectics, uh, which I encountered in the, in the heart of the pandemic. So it's been a real harbor of thought for me for a while. Um, for those of you who have followed along this series, uh, some of how I think of they and cooperation um, will resonate with uh, cooperism 113 when Tiffany Williams Roberts talked about a distinction between cooperation and co-optation. Uh, and cooperism 313 when Tracy McCarter talked about cooperation and concession. So some of these things will run through this as well. Um, I'm calling my little talk, Why We Return to They, Thinking, War, and Friendship. In 1933, in her early 20s, Simone Weil was living in a small, largely unfurnished apartment above a cafe and near a railroad bridge in Auxerre, where she had been appointed as a teacher. Between adult education stints, teaching workers and union members, she took some time to reflect on her August 1932 trip to Germany, where she went to understand better the foundations of the Nazi movement. In Germany, she saw that trade unions could be more reformist than revolutionary. And applying what she learned in Germany to France, she was especially worried about how workers' organizations could become too bureaucratic. It was against these two forces, fascism and state bureaucracy, that in August 1933, she published her essay, Prospects, Are We Heading for the Proletarian Revolution? In that essay, they described a new species of oppression, not force or capital, but management. She rejected the dichotomy of a capitalist state and a worker state, and instead argued that Stalin's regime was a centralized administrative system, a professional bureaucracy that was not social socialism, insofar as socialism for her meant the economic sovereignty of the workers. Against the increased specialization of bureaucracy, which elevated administration and collectivity over individuality, they argued in favor of giving workers not just mechanical training, but an understanding of the entire technical process. In this way, she called for the unification of manual and intellectual labor. It was in part for how an administrative system could become a powerful and oppressive state that they remained suspicious of collectivities throughout her life. And as we think with her to consider the theme of cooperism tonight, we will have to keep in mind her ongoing concerns about what she called collectivity meaning any group or community of people, such as a union, a church, or a political party. That said, as we begin to situate her within this series, we could note, resonant with Professor Harcourt's call to think beyond the dualism of capitalism and communism, they already, in this 1933 essay, looks beyond these terms, focusing instead on educating the workers, which is what she was doing not only in her theory but also in her practice at that time. Moreover, she invited intellectuals to understand their task differently. Skeptical about revolution and worried about collectivity, in prospects, they nevertheless look beyond the individual in order to invoke people thinking together. In a long quote about the importance of thinking the present and theorizing our society, she describes not a lone person, but a we. Here is this long quotation from that 1933 essay. If we are to perish in the battles of the future, let us do our best 
to prepare ourselves to perish with a clear vision of the world we shall be leaving behind. If, as is only too possible, we are to perish, let us see to it that we do not perish without having existed. The powerful forces that we have to fight are preparing to crush us, and it is true that they can prevent us from existing fully. That is to say, from stamping the world with the seal of our will. But there is one sphere in which they are powerless. They cannot stop us from working toward a clear comprehension of the object of our efforts, so that if we cannot accomplish that which we will, we may at least have willed it and not just have blindly wished for it. And on the other hand, our weakness may indeed prevent us from winning, but not from comprehending the force by which we are crushed. Nothing in the world can prevent us from thinking clearly. However, already by the next year, 1934, as she worked in factories around Paris, they started to argue against her previous point. She would come to see how labor could indeed prevent thinking. And by 1935, she would admit that some circumstances, such as oppressive working conditions, can indeed prevent us from thinking. In a Monday, 14 January, 1935 entry in the journal she kept while working in French factories, she writes, quote, the effect of exhaustion is to make me forget my real reasons for spending time in the factory and to make it almost impossible for me to overcome the strongest temptation that this life entails, that of not thinking anymore, which is the one and only way of not suffering from it. But setting that note aside, I want to stay for a moment with the Vey of 1933, who, as she watched fascism rise around her, but before she had to flee in exile as a Jewish person, gave us a path forward. Because for all of the biographical discussion that Vey sought a higher, better world, there is here in this early essay a real attachment to this world. If we are to perish, she says, let it at least be with a clear vision of the world we shall be leaving behind. Let us see to it that we do not perish without having existed. And the world she was leaving behind at that point was not just a world of her few possessions and her nearly empty apartment. It was also a world of her students, the friends she would write to, and the workers she advocated for, taught, and marched alongside, even when doing so went against the gender norms at that time, which such public contact across genders did as did her frequent cross-dressing in plain masculine clothes. So when she talks about stamping the world with her will, she might mean not carving her place into it as a mine marks a hill or a statue marks a university. She might mean thinking alongside others, willing to bring about fairer working conditions for a world closer to justice. There is also a distinction she makes between wishing and willing that I want to stay with them. Uh, with here for a moment as well. Wishing might mean wanting a world of better wages or more control of production without having a plan or having the courage to bring it about. Willing would mean saying that and then following through, having a goal, something of a concrete utopia perhaps to return to another theme of the seminars, but also having a model, a way of cooperating that gets us there. And this would mean knowing not just our goals, but knowing what we're up against, what she calls the force by which we are crushed. And it is this line on force, on the force that crushes us, that brings me to my second theme, that of war. Simone Weil's personal notebooks contained several references to the soldier and historian Thucydides, to whom she returned in 1939. It is from his history of the Peloponnesian War that we can start to gain a sense of how they understands war. For when Simone Weil thought of war, she not only considered the conflicts of her time, which she studied intensely and even participated in directly, but she also thought back to the ancient Greeks with the Melian dialogue ever echoing in her mind. Following the outbreak of war in France in early September, 1939, in Weil's circles, there was the idea that the objective must be to destroy Germany as a nation. By contrast, she argued that Nazi Germany was only part of a larger problem, the problem of modern civilization, 
which with its tendency toward universal conquest itself made Nazi Germany possible. Departing from how Hegel centered Geist or how Marx focused on class, by late 1939, they had started to see force itself as the key to history. And this reading of force would motivate her subsequent essay, The Iliad, for the poem of force. She herself translated the Greek she would use in that essay. And in an original reading of Homer, she argued that the main character of the Iliad is force itself. She stressed that it was not only those who suffer force who are controlled by it, but in fact, those who wield it are also under its seductive control. Further, even when force is not exercised immediately, but hinted at or used to threaten, they observed, it is still present and acting on us. In her Iliad essay, she described this twofold sense of force in terms of the force that kills and the force that does not kill just yet, adding that it will surely kill, it will possibly kill, or perhaps it merely hangs poised and ready over the head of the creature it can kill at any moment, which is to say, at every moment. So from Thucydides' telling of the Melian dialogue, they gained a continued alertness to the asymmetries in power, such that she would come to think of ethics in the context of war as exemplified in a refusal to exercise power. While this refusal does not change the conditions that led to the asymmetry in the first place, it does underscore that there always remains a possible alternative action to the Athenians' so-called realistic line in the Melian dialogue that always, and as if by nature, the strong do what they can and the weak suffer what they must. Thus, they did not place her faith in rights, law, or social movements in part because of how she read the Athenians as holding fast to their empire while throwing out the question of what is ethical, they always struggled to see human collectivity, including international collectives and their laws, as sites of justice. Because of how she read force in Homer, not as a tool we can use, but as something that controls us, she didn't see in structural asymmetries much room to maneuver. Further, she always kept close Plato's description in his Republic of human social life as a great beast. And by the end of her short life, she diagnosed in Wright's claims a commercial flavor advanced through a tone of contention as opposed to a spirit of attention. Ultimately, then, if we are to return to they to consider war, genocide, and siege, we might find a philosopher who asks us first to consider our own limitations and finitude as humans, who asks us to recognize how easily we can be swayed by nationalist thinking of any kind, as well as by any use of power we think we can control. For Simone Weil, the only just response to power is the refusal to use it. It is a negative use, a task that asks us not, as the Athenians told the Melians before beginning their siege, to let right alone, meaning not to ask questions about justice. No, they asks us to let force alone. In regard to war then, they offers us a critical, political, educational, and legal task so striking in its strangeness, so foreign to history, that it would perhaps take divine inspiration to be carried out. Or at least, as she would write in her later essay, Forms of the Implicit Love of God, again returning to Thucydides, now in April, 1942. To use asymmetrical force is to foreclose a relationship, not just with others, but also with the ethically and theologically charged world around us. Quote, those of the Athenians who massacred the inhabitants of Milos no longer had any idea of God. They wrote that April 1942 essay, Forms of the Implicit Love of God, from Marseille, during a month where she frequently attended Catholic Mass, a practice that became a theological side to her deeply political life in Marseille, which included often attending the trials of migrant workers from French colonies and sometimes walking the deserted streets at night. By this time in her life, they had already worked in French factories and fought in the Spanish Civil War. 
She had also worked during the grape harvest in a small French village in 1941. These actions were based not only on her skepticism of collectivity, but also on her view of ideal human relationships as occurring in small scale interactions through direct forms of organizing. Following Hannah Arendt, the political theorist Mary Dietz has written that Vey offers, quote, an illusory conception of human relationships as kinds of cooperative, friendly communions among fellow citizens. Thus, on Dietz's view, Vey offers a political theory that is ultimately anti-political. But following the conversations in this series on cooperation, we might begin to read Vey as someone advocating for a political theory of cooperation, where direct participatory decision-making is emphasized, and for an economic theory of cooperation, where growth is never placed above the sustainability of the environment and the community, which they always engage on the most local levels. That said, they would depart from Harcourt's social theory of cooperation that rejects punishment. For by the end of her life in the need for roots, while they would finally advance some form of collectivity, she would still see punishment as a vital need of the soul. But returning to her 1942 essay, Forms of the Implicit Love of God, to conclude with a note on friendship. There, they describes some forms of love as implicit because God cannot be an object, she says, present to human will. So for they, loving God takes as its immediate objects three things, religious ritual, the beauty of the world, and the neighbor. But then she says, to these three loves, perhaps friendship should be added. In a memorable line, she continues, friendship is a miracle by which a person consents to view from a certain distance and without coming any nearer, the very being who is necessary to him as food. Adding later, there is not friendship where distance is not kept and respected. Perhaps in this distance, I'm suggesting, we can hear not just physical space, but inability to maintain discussion and debate through disagreement as two people run their positions by each other, change them through each other, and in all cases agree implicitly to keep thinking together. While friendship is between individuals, for they, it also complements thinking in a time of war, reflecting a desire for a new theologically informed ordering of the world. Friendship has something universal about it, she says. As soon as we wish this autonomy to be respected in more than just one single being, we desire it for everyone, she goes on. We transport the center of the circle beyond the heavens. Although here they suggest that we orient ourselves toward God, once again, she is not calling for a renunciation of the world as critics often read her to be doing. Even her friends made this point. It was no secret that they loved to smoke cigarettes, so much so that her friends wrote about her, quote, of all the things belonging to material life, tobacco was the only one which she was almost certain to accept. But the fact that they wrote a book about their encounter with her, I would say, and the fact that she often smoked cigarettes while in conversation with them or union members or students suggests something else, namely that for Simone Weil, friendship was a key part in her efforts to engage and transform the world here below. That by practicing renouncing our desires for power and control over one another in our daily lives, we might begin to perform a different kind of political order. One need not have had encounters with Christ or believe in God as she did to affirm this point. I do not want to overstate it. It remains a point symptomatic of thinking in times of war when our political actions are inadequate and go unheard. So we return to focus on what is in our control, namely how we relate to those close to us. But it is nevertheless important to remember that for all of her suspicions of collectivities and collective action, they was not a philosopher who herself thought alone or who simply called for thinking alone. No. She would say that if we are to understand the forces that might still crush us, we will only come to this understanding and perhaps we will be able to act on it more effectively. Perhaps we will be able to sustain our actions if today we can teach about race and empire and siege 
if today we can write about land rights and state violence, knowing that our friends are behind us. Thank you. First of all, I want to thank you for this. I want to thank you for this uh, invitation. It's always a privilege to share one's work. I mean, also, all the work that I'm not going to do my share today is so much. I'm going to start with um, how I read uh Davis book this summer and all the ideas that came to me. I'm just gonna reflect on some of these ideas. So I'm gonna start with um a quote from uh, Simone Ver. She says, the love of our neighbor in all its fullness simply means being able to say to him or her, I added her, what are you going through? Uh, so the, the 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 this quote uh is comes from um a reflection that she was she was writing about um waiting for God at uh the do and uh, in that that book um, all that reflection she was making um the major question she asked is that the ability to ask your neighbor, Quel est ton tourment? what are you going through? She asked. And um, so I was, as I was reading um, David's book, I was thinking about all of this. What does it mean to turn around to look at your neighbor, to talk to your neighbor? And uh, how do you do that? Uh, so all these ideas for me really made me Think of also the question, some of the questions that I am interested in only, like the question of suffering. And uh, just just before we gather today, I was just telling uh, uh, Ben that in reading his book, I realized that Jean Genet, the author I worked on, read uh, Simone Weil um, on the question of colonialism, but does not give her any credit at all. Which I also noticed that many many. Um, I, I think, you know, Abe Camus is obvious, really gives it all the credit, you know. And Maurice Blanchot was inspired by Simone Weil. Uh, many of them were inspired by, by Simone Weil. Uh, Jean Genet wrote uh, the play The Blacks. In, the, in that play The Blacks, he really questioned, you know, the role of France, what, how France was colonizing all these nations around the world. And uh, so she was the first one to question that, to ask what I was going to do. So um, I think the, the the work I would like to do after reading this and after thinking uh, with you on the, your book is really to go back to time to to see how actually Jean Genet read Simone uh, Weil. I'm pretty sure I'm pretty convinced to be the work. Um, so. I just, I'm just, for me, um, so my little reflection here, I call it uh, radical solidarity. I think that's what she's doing uh, in her work. Um, for for very solidarity means the willingness to tie one's life with the life of the others, recognizing in so doing a kind of mutual debt. The fact that we owe something to one another here, it is a kind of original debt that can connect us with, uh, that connects us, which we are interpreted to address and we cannot wait. It is urgent. It has to be done in pursuit of life with the purpose of extending bonds of life and bonds of gain and bonds of mutual protection and reciprocity. That is how I understand the concept of solidarity in various work. Uh, Ray makes a point of history of resistance and struggle, the history of hope and the history of possibility. 
I think when you read her work and you have clarified these things in the book, you know, you see possibilities actually um, in what she was trying to do. I think Vey's work demands that we ask ourselves, do we have some specific role to play in unfolding the history of the world? What is it? What is our responsibility vis-a-vis -vis it? This is a privileged field of philosophical expression. At the center of her work is a concern for others. All the crises and movements are challenging for human existence. For Ver, these crises were something absolutely fundamental and so it seems that the way in which we form society, the way in which we make culture, we can thank Ver for expanding so powerfully, so extensively, the importance of the survival factor, survival of humanity and the special role she played in those crises. So we're gonna summarize the book, but I don't think I should maybe the end of the question. So I skip that part. Um, but the two two issues that really stuck with me in reading the book, the, the, the issue of, of, of uh, you know, how she addressed colonialism and also uh, marginality. For very marginal positions invite invention and exploration. Opening at the edges of culture and in its tracks, marginal activities can develop independently, eluding surveillance and policy. As Bell Hooks has written of marginality, it is, I quote, much more than a site of deprivation. It is a site of radical possibility, a space of resistance. It should come as no surprise that Bell chose to operate in such cultural margin, metaphorically, materially, politically, and that her work is situated and, uh, in these spaces. Bell's work was not only present in terms of rape rhetoric, but has also played an influential role in the cultural and social scene. Politics cannot be subtracted from rhetoric. Ethics is the inevitable philosophical problem to which we return when we ask ourselves that other inevitable problem, that of being. Because man wants to be human, Man, when you know, like within the French concept, uh, uh, you know, uh, social context, that man is human, right? So, uh, so the um, because human or man wants to be human, because all life wants to be, the concern of being precisely to be admirably formulated by Heidegger is one of the features that has always been noted in being. This desire to persevere in being. For they, there was also in the human being the possibility of caring for one another, of being for one another. It is a very simple idea and one that could be linked to altruism if altruism were, were not constantly reconciled with selfishness. To put it another way, they realized that another human's death can take precedence over her own, i.e. that another human's death can be a problem for her that precedes her own death. How insane is this? After all, is this any of her business? Yes, it is her business. She made life her business. She made other people's business her own business. So one can understand why the first thing that manifests itself in others is the gaze. What, why is it in this way that others are in relation to her? First and foremost, what is absolutely made of the very gaze, the very bear? Why from the outset, bear offers herself to this question? Because it's tempting to destroy that which is real. Her responsibility towards the other is the first response, the first language that she has articulated in her work. But if she is caught up in her responsibility towards others from the outset, from the moment 
of encounter. Don't she risk being handed over to her father to give up her freedom? Or one should say, you know, give up your own freedom. I think if one is caught up in responsibility for others from the outset, um, from the moment of encounter, don't we risk being handed over to the other to give up what I said, freedom? Yes, but there it is clear that that's a lot before it. It is an interesting question to ask, and I will answer it as follows. Freedom isn't the fact that no one gives me others, nor it is the negation of its external constraint. The condition of my freedom is the fact of my decision. I am the only one to whom this responsibility has been entrusted, and no one else can carry it out to me. And I think that's what Simone Beck did in the work. Simone Beck clearly understood that for the most vulnerable among us, there is a great deal at stake. And silence is the face of all this injustice. She said it's not acceptable. I think she heard me. Well, then just do it. Every still presupposes a supplement. There is me, there is the other, and there is the third, and the third of beings. All the more reason to be wary of love, of the principle which often leads us to forget the third party, to forget the world. But the third party is there, and we don't know what he's or her uh, or they're doing, I should say, to the other. If it, if it does something to me, that's fine. I can protest. It is my other, my neighbor. But what, what, if nothing happens, and what if no one speaks up, if no one does anything, what will happen? That's why I say we have to add, add to the ethics of others, to this clarity given to others, the necessity of a comparison. And that's terrible. It is terrible. It is scandalous to compare the incomparable. What is unique? And yet we must objectivity and knowledge begin there. And so does justice, since it is found beside the end of objective time. Justice is born to despair the beginning of life. So these these are my reflections, what I gathered from what I, I read the book and from I'm from um sorry, I hope I hope you guys heard me. And from what I know of Simone Ray's work. Um I knew that Ben is going to be here. Both our specialists are going to gather uh, my reflections. So this, these are my two senses. Wonderful. Thank you, Professor Okoto. Thank you, Professor Davis. Um, so I wanted to just. Uh, I want to to uh, to add a few thoughts um, now, uh, and I think I, I'll style this under the header kind of the paradox of collectivity, maybe the paradox of collectivity, um, or maybe the the conflict, which seems the, the internal conflict in in Simon Weil's thought between a certain resistance to collectivity, right, which is where, where Ben Davis started, and this idea of being suspicious of collectivities, uh, and on the other hand, this radical solidarity, um, which is what you were bringing in, uh, Rita. And so how, how, do we, how, do we, how do we work through, and I think it's really an important dilemma, how do we work through the, the suspicion of collectivity and the radical uh, solidarity? Um, and you, when you were talking about the suspicion of collectivity, uh, Ben, I was thinking about actually one of the first quotes that you have here, which I, I find fascinating in your book and which I've already 
used for the next session we're going to be having, which is all going to be about state capitalism, the Frankfurt School and state capitalism. But it's this passage, this striking passage where Weil writes, this is in 1933 in Prospects, one cannot disregard the fact, she writes, that all the political currents which now affect the masses, whether they style themselves fascist, socialist, or communist, tend towards the same form of state capitalism, right? The same form of state capitalism would, and the same, and her objection to the, uh, the way in which uh, collectivities do that, centralization, her, her real opposition to centralization, but at the same time, this radical solidarity, how can we put these together? So that's a little bit what I'd like to address. And, and I think I'll do it through, again, the, uh, the writings on the factory mm -hmm. Uh, that she did, the uh, factory journal, uh, Journal de, de l'Usine, that she wrote while she was uh, at the factory. And um, I've written a longer piece about this on the blog, which is a little bit personal. I'm going to skip the personal part. I want to focus on the, on the theoretical and the praxis part. Um, now, one of the things that, so as we know, as Ben mentioned, uh, she went to work in this factory, first uh, Alstom, which was Société Générale des Constructions Électriques et Mécaniques in Paris, where she was making these small pieces, uh, a very routinized, uh, very industrial, routinized, manual labor, creating these pieces um, down on the, on the southern periphery of Paris. And she took these field notes. And one of the things that she found was cooperation, actually. Um, but limited, a limited form of cooperation. She writes, cooperation, comprehension, mutual appreciation of one's work, those are the monopoly of the managerial classes in the modern factory. Now, so she found cooperation, but found that it was only limited to certain classes and was not extended to the workers, no possibility of cooperation among the workers, or for that matter, of respect, of mutual recognition, of appreciation or understanding for the workers. They toiled, they couldn't talk to each other. She was, she, she brought, couldn't talk to each other from their different workstations, couldn't even glance at each other, and had no idea of what they were producing, how it related to social use, how the, the product that they were making was going to be uh, used in society, whether it was going to be used, they didn't know it was going to be used actually in a metro or in, a, in, in but, but they did, had no idea. And as a result, she says, you know, they were treated as brutes, thoughtless machines and pure physical movement. She has this remarkable passage. Later on, she writes, but so she has her journal d'usine, but later on, she writes another text that's much more synthetic in terms of what her experience was. It's called Experience de la Vie d'usine, so the experience of life in the factory and she writes no society can be stable when a whole category of workers works every day all day with disgust this disgust in work alters the workers whole conception of life their whole life harm has come from factories and this harm needs to be corrected in the factories it's difficult but perhaps not impossible first of all the specialists engineers and others need to be sufficiently concerned not only with building products but also with not destroying people, not to make them docile, not even to make them happy, but only not to force any of them to degrade themselves. Now, so this was in the context in which actually she was very taken by Marx's analysis of uh, oppression and of the mechanisms of capitalist oppression. Um, she was also very taken by Marx's materialism, uh, which she felt actually that no one, including Marx, she felt hadn't really taken advantage of. Um, that's one of the things she writes. She writes, no Marxist has really deployed it, this form of materialism, not even Marx himself. But she was very, she very, very taken by it. And of course, actually, there's an interesting parallel here, I think, with the young Foucault, um, who was, uh, whose, whose first book, um, uh, Psychologie and Personnalité, actually, is a, is a Marxist book on, on, uh, on psychology, um, but he too was very taken by Marx's materialism. And in a way, one can interpret all of his early work as trying to find a different way of being materialist. And it through, particularly through experience, uh, through through reading Binswanger and existential analysis. But anyway, 
So she was taken by Marx's analysis so much so, in fact, that she had a hard time understanding how it could be possible to overcome, uh, which is, I think, one of the problems that she was constantly dealing with, kind of like how entrenched these forms of um, oppression were. And that actually, and, and she also had this resistance to uh, Marx and, and other notions of revolution, um, particularly troubled by the idea of revolution, feeling that it was really just going to be sending the masses to their slaughter, that it didn't have positive content. And so as a result, she comes up with uh, a different way to address these problems in, in the factory, particularly. And the idea was to change the way that people work. And so this, in part, is based on this immersive philosophical praxis of actually doing the work herself, being in the factory day after day. And so she proposes to, in order to kind of eliminate the disgust, um, to transform the relation each worker has with the functioning of the factory, with the machines, with the way that time operates in the workplace. Workers need to gain a sense of accomplishment and understanding of what they're doing, of the, of the product that they're making and how it's going to contribute to society and how it fulfills the needs of society. They need to be able to bring their families into the workplace so that they can show them what they're doing so that their families understand and that they can have a relationship that extends in terms of kind of comprehension. Um, this is all in the in the factory uh, journals, which are really fascinating. And in that other uh, piece, the experience, they needed more autonomy, they needed more choice, they needed to, um, to be able to have some say in uh, what they were going to do, what their next, uh, what their next tasks would be, what the longer term project would be. This wouldn't happen, she argued very much, but it wouldn't happen through propaganda, through uh, proletariat uprising, um, uh, but uh, rather through a form of, well, I mean, educational uh, transformation. She had this idea about how schooling needed to be made more concrete. Uh, so that it could be, in a way, related to uh, the fa the factory work, um, and um, and and essentially that the workers need to be treated with some forms of respect and humanity. Now, um, uh, and as long as they had no idea how their work fit in, they would always feel exploited. It would be very different. She wrote. If the worker knew clearly every day, every instant, what part they are playing in the fabrication of the factory and what place their factory plays in society. Um, and so, and so uh, ultimately, uh, she felt that it was possible to achieve some form of, well, certainly comprehension, certainly mutual appreciation, but also some form of cooperation through uh, this transformation of the workplace. Um, and, um, and, and, and this idea that they, that the workers would come to feel that their work is indispensable, right? The, the real problem here was that humans were being treated like machines and the machines were being treated like, or taking the role of, uh, humans was what she said. Uh, and then also she, 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 so, uh, she, she also had other, suggestions uh, she she discusses automation um and the way in which it could possibly relieve workers of just the kind of repetitive manual tasks uh and so she has a kind of a, a way of discussing the relationship between the worker and the machine that was pretty um fascinating now uh as i read some of these passages i i i wasn't fully I didn't feel fully satisfied. And in part, it has something to do, I think, with her conceptions of freedom, her conceptions of individualism. I mean, it's the wrong term is individualism, but it is a form of individualism. I mean, it was, I, I, that wouldn't be a term that she would have liked, I think, but, but I, I characterize it somehow as a form of in, individualism um, and a very, and to a certain extent, a, a very Kantian notion of autonomy, uh, it seems to me, ultimately, um, where, you know, one, if, if one, un, a rationalist Kantian concept of autonomy, where if one understands what one's position is, then, then one achieves a certain form of liberation or autonomy. Um, 
Uh, but 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 I, I wasn't totally satisfied. And of course, um, the of course the the times were very different. Like the factory in 1934 was a was a was a different place. At least the comparable Western factory today uh, in a country like France. And she was being paid piecework, right? I mean, it was really how many of those little small things could she punch out with the right hole in the middle? Um, and you know, if you you, you, know, you did a thousand of those, then you it would end up that you'd get you know three francs an hour or something. But if you didn't, so there was an incredible pressure on people working. They would get fired for not producing the n- n- number of pieces, and um, there was no security. Uh, you know, we're in a very different space today in the factory. To a certain extent, we're we're possibly in a place. Uh, in a comparable factory, right, in the West, in France, say, with a strong union. And, you know, we were we were watching the, the documentary of the Leap uh, Clock Factory, right, um, with Etienne uh, a couple of weeks ago. I mean, it's, it's a very different situation. Uh, general assemblies. Um, so it, it could be that in a way, we have, I don't want to use the word progressed, but changed sufficiently that my dissatisfaction has something to do with that um, because it doesn't feel as if that gets sufficiently to the larger structural problems of modes of production, uh, private property, structural questions of political economy. Um, and uh, But it is in part related to her unique heroic conception of liberty and freedom, I think. Um, her dislike of political parties and of collectivities uh, and of collectivities and political parties who would tell you how to think. Um, now, I did I did notice in, in the last work, uh, The Need for Roots, I think that was her last work, right? The Need for Roots, um, probably to a declaration of duties toward mankind. Uh, there she also meditated on cooperative forms, and there she proposed working conditions that were somewhat more radically transformed. Uh, it's a short passage, but nevertheless, it's there. Uh, and where she's talking about uh, transforming it to the extent that one could actually have the worker working at home, possibly. Or, she says, in small workshops, this is her quote, in small workshops, which could very often be organized on a cooperative basis. So I thought that that was a little bit uh, more promising in terms of uh, transformative proposals. But nevertheless, in any event, this for me raised at least three questions that I thought are, are, are very relevant to our conversations about cooperation. Um, the first is, uh, how could an immersive philosophical praxis promote more ambitious societal transformation, right? How do you work on the larger structural transformations when you are so deeply engaged, when you're so in the weeds on the praxis? Uh, and in a way, I felt that her her reflections on the factory and the transformation were um, were somehow connected to the fact that she was so close to the the work itself that she w- might not have been it might not have been getting at the larger structural issues of political economy uh, that would be so important. Now, I think that's a challenge for ideas of cooperism as well, right? Because ideas of cooperism start with one's own praxis, one's own starting a worker co-op or starting a food co-op or starting a mutual organization or mutual aid. All of it starts very um, grassroots, um, uh, level. And the question is, of course, from that, how can one imagine large structural transformations of society? I mean, that's something that, you know, I think many of us uh, think about, like, th- these are great ideas, uh, mutual aid, and but but is it going to, is it going to cause a real structural transformation of the political economy? Now, I've argued that you know, in part, it's the question of critical mass. In part, it's a question of a snowball effect, possibly, in the case of cooperism. In part, it's maybe it's like 
the only possible way forward. So, um, so one can anticipate that it would possibly lead through combining and consolidating concentration and leveraging to a, you know, a cooperative society. But I think that's the first question. What's the relationship in a way between the immersive philosophical praxis that is so in the weeds and come up with uh, social transformation? The second uh, issue or question, I think, is that the intersection uh, that we've been exploring in this seminar of reforms, non-reformist reforms, abolition, and more radical paths. Um, so while ultimately adopted a pretty reformist position, I would argue, in her uh, factory work uh, journals, so rejecting Marxism, rejecting calls for revolution, to a certain extent rejecting the kind of the language of the language of class struggle in favor of transforming the conditions of workers to make their lives more bearable. Perhaps that was just a first step towards a larger political economic transformation, but I didn't get a sense of that in the writings. And um, and so and so we've been dealing a lot with this question of uh, reforms and non-reformist reforms. And so I think that this ties in pretty well. I I and I'm not sure where it leads me. I'd like to. Well, for the third point, maybe um, uh, before I, uh, yeah, we're before because that's where I'll end. I think that uh, what's also interesting is that in her work there is a unique um, confrontation of theory and praxis. Right? Um, she, you know, she 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 writes this essay, reflection on on liberty and social oppression, which is her. Magnum Opus, he says it's like a hundred, it's a it's a long essay. It's a hundred page essay. It's like it's it's engaged marks and it's at a high theoretical level. And as she polishes it off, she's like, okay, now I need to go in the factory. Right. And she says, and and um, and then you have the quote of what she said about um why she needed to leave. It was really to kind of to theor to, to understand this properly, right? Um that's remarkable. Now, what is it? It is. It's not that the praxis was then going to. In, well, I think the praxis was going to inform the theory. It's not that the praxis was going to. Was was she testing the theory, through the praxis, um, right? I mean, so what is the relationship exactly? I mean, that's the third question. Now, I've in in other work I had tried to suggest that there are five possible relationships, kind of either you're coming from the theory to the praxis or you're coming from the praxis to the theory. And I had, uh, whatever. Here, here, I think it is a confrontation, a test. I think it's a testing. But um, but I think that, I mean, what, what I am most drawn to is the immersive philosophical praxis as a constant confrontation of theory and praxis. Not as necessarily dictate, not not as a deductive mechanism to theorize, nor simply as a kind of test null hypothesis. It's not like okay, you do the theorizing, you come up with a test, then you go into the factory to determine whether it's right or not. I think somehow it's got to be that it's a that it's a constant confrontation where both are being informed by the other I th and i think that that's what is what is the richness of the immersive philosophical praxis um and so ultimately yeah i i would i would to these questions i would want to develop this method of immersive philosophical praxis as a way not simply to inform theory but to constantly confront kind of critique and praxis um, so, so those are some questions and some thoughts, but I think in a way they really build on the confrontation between the anti-collectivities uh, that you were talking about, Ben, and the radical solidarity that you were talking about, Frida. So, um, so let's do this. Uh, we can, we can maybe, maybe I'll give one round back. Uh, to Ben and Frida before we open it up to uh, questions and conversation. Okay. Does that sound fair? Is this good? 
Okay. Um, I guess I'll just be very brief in response so we can open it up. But one of the things I've also been thinking of and with the other discussions of this series is how many questions uh, this is perhaps more reflective of just where we're at with theory and the academy and so on, are theoretical about whether we have or they has or whatever struck the right balance between theorizing the society and then the cooperative society to come. And I am sympathetic, or how I read your discussion of this as well, and what I think they would be open to, um, is the sense, the educational sense of these projects. So her late Need for Roots uh, emphasis on local practices, deeply informed by her time uh, picking grapes, <laughs> uh, would be a process to learn from, much like, I don't know, I think the best analogy for the factory work is if, you know, whatever it is, you're at Columbia Law School or the, the best school in the time as she was, and then you go drive Lyft for a year. And then you, you know, the gig, the gig economies maybe are equivalent, the kind of most precarious of the time. And then the rest of your life is informed by that. So in other words, there's an educational element to the tests that I think it's around some of the you know, do, do we pose the tension right? Because we just don't know. <laughs> or uh, we don't know if we banked in credit unions and, and all these things. Uh, uh, and including the personal aspect, like Vey's trying to serve uh, immigrants, for instance, instead of um, serving the powers of her time, struggling with the questions and the psychological <laughs> toll that took on her, much like, you know, perhaps... Uh, people who become public defenders or these kind of things when they could be working at uh, whatever job. Um, that was an educational process. And so I think I'm sympathetic to the sense that the practical questions of the sort of ethical dimensions that prevent people from making the decisions that she did, whatever the pressures people are feeling, uh, that seems to me more of more theoretical interest, uh, right? Why is it that, to go back to some of our discussion earlier of critical legal studies or so much of the uh, uh, academy, including where I work, you know, there's this stress that the best thing you can do is work some kind of job. Uh, uh, it ha definitely has to do with how much debt we ask our students to take on. But that could be a, a place of intervention for theory, not just is Bay radical enough? What was her, did she get kind of marks right? You know, I'd be interested in those inquiries that would allow room to, room to maneuver in the, the practical tests that other people that would be interesting to read her with, like Stuart Hall, you know, talked about politics as without guarantees. We don't know what will come, but there's also an element of educating ourselves and educating others together in that political group, the, the new left groups for Hall or uh, Vey's maybe solidarity uh, with the workers that starts to bring about the new society that isn't just working it out on the page. She tried to work it out on the page and then, <laughs> you know, dropped the quit, quit, <laughs> went to work it out with others. So that that's the only thing I'll say um, about theory and practice. Thanks, Ben. Thank you. Well, yeah, I, I think, you know, to, to your third question, you know, theory and praxis, I think for they, you know, the way I see it or the way I understand her in, in this, uh, this struggle, how to do it, is it was a way of being. I mean, she, I, I don't think she, she went and theorized it and then left and then went to the factory. I think it was it was a way of of she was really serious about being in a world and and 
being is a, a, a human without power, without all the structures that we have that make us, I don't know, so important in life or whatever. She, I, I think she wanted to, you know, the to go to a factory. You know, when I was writing my my dissertation, I went to the prison. You know, I mean, I wanted to see what was going on inside the prisons. And you know, I see this. So it, it wasn't that I theorized that, and I went to the prison. And then the people that read my book, actually, it's interesting. Uh, uh, psychologists that work in prison. Academics don't read the book. You know, it's really interesting. But I had to go to the prison to see how people were managing. You know, how was life inside the structure? Of, you know, what happened to you inside there? So I think for there, it was really, it was, is, she, she, I mean, it was a being, a being. How do we conceptualize who we are in the world, right? So to go to a factory, actually, the you know she had such a she was a teacher. She left all of that. I mean, she said, "I'm going to try this, but not to come back to theorize, but just to to be to to." I, I don't even want to say to understand what they were doing there because I mean, you know, all you need to do is to uh, to even see, you know, how some somebody who works in a factory, when you see them, you understand the crazy life in a, in a factory is difficult. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you see them, as you said, you know, you're tired, you can't think, you know, you know your freedom is gone. You know, the more you work, you don't even make money. But you, I mean, you see it physically how people are, right? Uh, so, so for me, there was, I mean, it was is is that that a struggle? Is it, I mean, to go to a factory is to can I can I be like this? Can I can I manage that? So, you know, so. And this was when you were writing the Genet book. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So writing the Genet book, you felt the need to understand the prison, right? Was did, was were these prisons in France or? Yeah, in yeah. France. I uh, I was fortunate to meet uh, Maître Lévy, uh, you know Thierry Lévy, who took me there, and then I also met uh, um, Vergès. Mm. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So they both took me to mm -hmm. many of them. Vergès is a remarkable attorney, defense attorney. A defense attorney. Human rights attorney. Yeah, incredible uh, thinker as well. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, at first, you know, they say, okay, you need to go inside the prison to, to you know, for you to write. To, 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 to. Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. how I started. Mm -hmm. I spent mm -hmm. hours and hours walking around talking to prisoners. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Because of Genet's time in prison yeah, was so prison, formative yeah. to his writing. Yeah, exactly. And mm -hmm. then also I went to the, some of the cells where he mm -hmm. spent time to, mm -hmm. to see. Mm -hmm. And it was an incredible experience. It was, it was, um, yeah, I think that was really formative for me. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Yeah. Good, good, good. Okay, so I propose that we um, open up the conversation and uh, we've got, okay, we've got a lot of hands, so that's good. All right, we're going to start. Um, Allison, Preston, I saw Stefano, Parker, Dorothea, Alon. So why don't we take, uh, and Kathy, Kathy, who's a, Kathy, Wallerstein, who's a Simone Weil expert and has a chapter on it in her in her manuscript. Okay, uh, Allison, you want to start? Um, and I would like to know what like the actual experts here think about this, but I would like to respectfully push back on the um, parallel of Wheel and Kant. Because when, when we think about Kant, I think his his ideas like act so your actions are part of a universal law. Whereas in Wheel, Wheel wanted to gather life from a social movement. 
So when I actually, when I was reading Wheel, rather than thinking of a European practice, I was actually thinking of Emerson's um, idea of experience, of Emerson's, uh, the American scholar, where he basically starts uh, giving a an essay, uh, a speech to future clergy, telling them that the Bible doesn't really teach them anything, but man does not and does not know an experience he has not lived. And that is the way that I really read, like the, the factory journal, whereas like, I think the theory came after because I think she really did understand that she did not know what she did not know. So then why would she then spend six months, not a month, not two, but six, half a year. Um, so, so for me, I, I think that's important because when we think about Kant, I think of he's still a dualist. So his mind is still outside of his body. But when you're reading the factory journals, even though they're not feeling their feelings because, you know, it's happening from Monday to Friday and it's in, in a little bit of on a Saturday where you really think the pain, it is still embodied. It is still something that that is physical, but the associated. But when I say think of Kant, the body doesn't exist. So I, I still think that I see her more of a little bit of a transcendentalist rather than a Kantian in, in, in a form because I still think that Kant thinks of an idea of a universal law and if you truly have a theory of care that can't be universal, that has to be specific to the body that's in front of you, to the life, to the context that, that you are experiencing. So if I'm supposed to love even the person who colonized me because someone else cares about them and that is the radical theory of care, it can't be universal. It has to be contextual. So I just wanted to know what other people thought about that. Um, thank you all again for um, coming to um, speak with us. Um, I guess for me, one of the things that I am, um, I was curious about, and I actually wrote my my essay on, uh, was about like her basically her philosophy that she put in her nature of work, which I thought was her magnum opus. So I'm actually pretty concerned that Harcourt thought there was maybe something else. So please ignore that in my essay. Um, but I will say that what I am kind of confused about generally is how she thinks that most of her ideas are going to be implemented. Because when I read her book, it seemed like I agreed with everything. It seemed like she was asking for almost like a spiritual revolution of the workers and and uh, how we view work. But I mean, forgive me. I mean, I view things of like how things are actually implemented based off of like how things can be changed. And mostly that's through violence. I mean, my name is Preston. I didn't get that name because I come from a part of the world where people are named Preston. People named me that. Like I see things through the lens of violence because violence is what's been placed upon me since um, and that's my entire conception of reality so I don't understand how someone can go and you know fight against Franco and also fight against the Nazis and see all this but then also think that you know one day we're just going to come to this understanding of how we relate to work and things are going to change I mean the workers aren't given the ability to think and transform their lives in a way because violence is placed upon them. So if she's not thinking, well, a proletarian revolution is going to do it, how else are we supposed to come to that conclusion? Like, it's like, it's, it's just like based off reforms with the people who are empowered are not going to allow you to get to those reforms. So I'm just like, I feel like it's an impasse. Like, where, where do you go from that? Um, so once again, thank you for speaking. And uh, I was just curious about. That. Thanks, uh, Kathy Wallerstein. Um, you're next. Thank you. Bernard, it's working. I think Good. so. Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, um, Professor uh, Davis and Professor Akoto. That was really um, that was really wonderful. And I can't wait to read your book. I haven't read it yet. Um, my my own work on Ve is more on her uh, the mystical aspects um, and on do creation, which of course is also extremely political. I mean, it's it's all, um, but this is more the um, the irrational 
uh, side of of ve more the um, the sort of even absurd um, and for instance um, uh, in her book uh, in gravity and grace right she has entire sections where she talks about that the only fault of humans is that we can't live off of uh, uh, um, sunlight why we can't be like plants and she's she's I mean she's both serious and not but she is serious and and I I wonder if you, I mean, there's a couple different parts to this question. This is the first part um, where you see, I mean, she, she sort of, you know, this, she's, she's known for her demand for, to attention, her call to attention. And she calls us to attention to the, to the contradictions of being human, to the contradictions of living in the modern world um, in, in ways that um, you've all pointed out. Um, but to, to the point where she says, you know, eating is always killing. Love is always killing, is always um, consuming the other. I mean, she really sort of, um, in a very fascinating way, sort of really in, insists, demands that we engage with the contradictions of life and and aim for the impossible. I mean, she she died of anorexia. She she you know she did she refused food. I mean, it was also uh, tuberculosis, but I mean, she, she actually pushed that to the limit in her life. And I mean, she has writings about suicide. I mean, like Camus, the real question for her, I think, was the question of suicide. You know, how can you kill yourself within life? How can you abdicate the self to God? How could all in the service of building a better world? Absolutely. And I'm so I'm just um, very complex writing. And at the same time, beautifully simple um and i'm just this is um still part one <laughs> i'm just i'm wondering um um how you know if you engage at all with that side of her writings and how uh in, in your view of her political philosophy how that kind of call to the absurd almost um fits in and then related to that um uh, well, I guess I, I mean, I, I did kind of cover this related to that is this, um, abdic it, well, in fact, Bernard, some of what you were saying, uh, perhaps touched on this in a lot of ways, she is writing about the self, right? She talks very directly about the abdication of the self. And again, um, through this detachment and suicide and this giving the eye over to God. And, um, um, yeah, I, I guess I've, I've kind of said everything, um, but again, also, how do you see that in relation to this um, notion of cooperatism? So, big questions. Great. So um, let's start a round of of, uh, of thoughts, uh, and I'll turn first to Ben. Uh, maybe I'll just do one caveat first to get Kant off the table. But uh, I, I, I don't want to go. I, I wasn't in. Uh, I said it with hesitation, but there's something about reason. There's something about there's something about the relationship between reason and liberty in her work that reminds me of uh, something about a notion of autonomy being defined as being able to understand and govern yourself. Okay, and so that that that's it. But I, I wouldn't, you know, I don't want to go into dualisms and other things it just, but just there's, there's some element of faith in reason that I that seems so actually important to me in her work um, and that feels enlightenment oriented so that that was that was it so I'll bet I, I'll, I'm happy to take Kant off the table um, well I'll just say Kant was on the table for Ve. Uh, she read and liked Kant um, particularly his stress on ends, treating other humans as ends. Um, though missing <laughs> the embodiment question is interesting. And I also think, I don't know if there's been much work on um, Emerson and Vey, you know, because you mentioned the American scholar where he says self-trust is the foundation of all the virtues. And uh, Vey was, you know, to your question, uh, self-trust was is not in Vey's writing. So I would be very interested in... Uh, I don't know if you've written on Emerson and Bay, but that would make a wonderful discussion. Um, implementing ideas. 
the perhaps um might be unsatisfied you know she had these plans like a parachute core uh uh at different times um uh one most famously to parachute uh nurses um and she herself it seemed very much wanted to be on the front lines in uh world war ii as she tried to be in the spanish civil war but because she was clumsy speaking of embodiment uh ended up had to be sort of rescued by her parents, which was often the case. Um, so I don't know, we might need Vey plus, you know, for the practical solutions, uh, unless you're on board with the uh, parachute core and these kind of suggestions, which she took seriously. I find it, I don't know what to say. Um, um, uh, I have not, you know, volunteered for such a thing or been about such a thing to say the least. Uh, um, okay, and then uh, I'll just finish with decreation and attention and cooperation comments. Yeah, I don't write so much about that in here because I think the Anglophone Ve reception has been so geared to her religious writings and uh you know she was so worried at the end of her life that people would focus on her life that she was weird or, or whatever perhaps mentally ill many people say or uh and not her thoughts so i wanted to read her like we read most philosophers particularly male philosophers uh for their ideas largely that they put out in the world so i tried to look at what she deliberately published with a few exceptions like uh, the factory journal. Um, so that was kind of the method. So not a lot on decreation. And I think one of the reasons is I never know, you know, I have notebooks, I have letters or emails. I don't think it represents my philosophy or political philosophy well. I think it's a part of human life that's interesting um, but often very different, right? Because I don't know what y'all's experience is, but we, to your point of contradictions, we test out things we're not sure of in these notebooks. We test out positions that are not really ours, right? Okay, my friend said this about this war. Are they right? Am I missing something? You know, and then you work it out. So when we read that, I mean, it's incredibly rich. Um, but I don't know, I don't know what to make of it in truly with respect to situating Vey in the history of philosophy, because we do not do that with Kant, for instance, uh, it seems. So I'll, um, stop there. Rita, do you want to, do you want to add a word or two? I say that, uh, the, the work you're doing, I, I think, you know, spirituality, you spoke about spirit, spirituality is something to, for me, it's kind of, it's just, it goes beyond even who we are, you know. And um, when, when um, and, and, and I think that's why most people that do work on spirituality, they don't take them seriously because it's something that is like beyond us. I think at that point for that, you know, um, she was trying to figure it out, even the question with God and, you know, so spirituality is really at the core of what she was, the, the contradiction, I think, and, and how you, you really, it becomes difficult to get out of it. And I, and I think for me, that's when it was the end, she's like, okay, I'm just, I may just go because there's nothing else. For me, is is that uh, you know? So that's you know, yeah. That's that's how I I, I read her. You know. Yeah, and uh, you know the only the only last thing I would say I think we've covered we've covered these comments, but something about violence um, is so. I think so. I mean, there's 
real internal conflict, I think, between earlier pacifism and, and a, a strong pacifism and then her engagements, right, uh, in the Spain and then her decision to join the Free French, et cetera. So these are things she was struggling with. Um, you know, she has this passage where she, she, she was writing against, I mean, so when Franco uh, has his coup in, in uh, 36, I think it was February 36, uh, uh, anyway, anyway, when he, uh, July, whatever, in July of 36, um, uh, the uh, the French the government in France is the Front Populaire, which is a leftist uh, government, which she was favorable to, by contrast to the other previous governments, etc. Um, but the Front Populaire engages in uh, in an act of non uh, intervention, so they specifically take the position that they're they're not going to intervene in Spain, right? And um, and in part, it's her reflections on that and the conflicts and what it means to not intervene and why not intervene in this case. Uh, if there ever was a case, it would be to intervene in this case. And so, I mean, I think that she was struggling with those questions herself um, and 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 her resistance to revolution is something that's important. Um, a resistance to revolution because she really felt like, I mean, uh, in part because she felt it was going to result in slaughter, basically. Um, so, so I think that the, I mean, there's there there's there's a lot in the work that's trying to address this. Um, so okay, all right. Now I've got um, I've got Dorothea Parker, Stefano, and Alone next, and then. And then we'll have another round after that. But let's start with uh, Dorothea. Thank you so much. Um, I'm uh, be reading from some notes I've been taking uh, because I'm I'm not quite sure how. Uh, I'm I'm gonna do my best to keep this organized, but um, so when um, I guess Professor Harcourt um, started this discussion with um, a couple of questions, um, one of them um, relating to the um, changing nature of work and production since the time of um, Simone Weil's writing and another relating to um, her conception of the relation between theory and praxis. Um, we've talked a bit about the importance of uh, a sort of self-consciousness um, or uh, an, an immersive philosophy uh, to her theory of change that um, change comes about in, in large part through um, those engaged in production um, being able to think through their production and those, I guess, capable of thinking through uh, being engaged. Um, we've talked a bit about how um, for her at the time of writing, um, she saw uh, she saw a major obstacle to that, I guess, theory of change in um, exhaustion from work and the impossibility of um, thinking while at work. I was, I guess, wondering whether um, with uh, subsequent changes in the relation between um, production um and sorry with the uh let's say um i'm going to summarize over a, a lot of things at once here but with the advent of uh consumer society the society of the spectacle uh growing predominance of intellectual uh labor and cultural and 
aesthetic production within the production process, um, whether that poses new um, and distinct problems for uh, a kind of self-consciousness within labor, when consciousness isn't just crowded out by exhaustion, um, but is monopolized and used by capital in the production process itself. Um, I, I have in mind here, I think, what Friedrich Jameson in his book on postmodernism refers to as the um, abolition of uh, critical distance um, in uh, uh, under the um, under postmodern hegemony. Um, I'm wondering what new challenges this changing relation between uh, intellectual labor and production poses for Vey's conception of theory and praxis and um, maybe to put things more skeptically, uh, how can we still use they when the relation between production and thought has been so radically changed? Uh, hi, thanks for uh, the talk and everything. Um, so my question's connected to the factory journals and also uh, Professor Harcourt's uh, blog posts on the subject. And so the way I conceptualized it was I, I served in a factory of sorts. Uh, I was in the military for four years and I identified greatly with uh, Vale's uh, factory writings, like the idea of suffering to not thinking to survive. You have to very actively not think in order to just get through your day. And this isn't combat talking. This is like daily life um, in your experience in the military. Um and thinking about the uprootedness, in sh which she talks about uh, with the uh, working class and the need for roots, I started contemplating how that analysis might apply to the factory workers, the cogs of the machine of state violence. And um, so the, the people that are in that are at the active perpetrators of state violence, the ones who are making it happen, not the decision makers not the people thinking it through, but the people that are acting in an uprooted way and perpetrating it, the soldiers, the sailors, the Marines, uh, the police, and also the bureaucrats. So all of these people that have to essentially turn off their brains, they have to not think they're constantly suffering in order to survive their daily existence in this kind of factory of sorts that are perpetuating the kind of state violence that we are all kind of arguing against and the ve is also kind of pushing against and if the analysis is placed there is there room for i guess progress if we want to use the word and ad addressing that kind of uprootedness instead of uprootedness in the workers if these are the ones perpetuating it solving the situation there instead of focusing on the workers maybe was where my kind of thought process has been for the last like two weeks um been waiting for this moment. Um, I was wondering if you all could talk a little bit about how um Vale's writing relates to globalization. I know she talked uh about colonialism uh in her work, but especially as so much like there there seems to be uh, less and less, more and more inequality when it comes to working conditions as as time goes on. There, and this might relate a little bit to what Preston was talking about, maybe if there is a benefit to having um, um, so many people experiencing these, ex these um, experiences in solidarity and that it could lead to violent uprising or it could lead to more power, more negotiating power through a, a broader collective. Um, it, yeah, so it's my thought of how that would relate to globalization and how she would, if she would change her thoughts with the way working conditions work today. Um, maybe we'll switch it up. Frida, you want to start? Some... Yep. 
Um, I, I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with your, your question of globalization. I mean, um, I, I, I think that um, the very so already in, in the, the working conditions of, of being in a factory, I mean, it was already, it was already global, you know, and colonialism was part of that, right? You know, uh, you know the way they use the body, you know, uh, it was the body was commodity, and she understood that already. And uh, is nothing has changed as far as that is concerned. You know? It's just global. I think we're all leaving it, um, you know, and we all see the suffering, the excessive suffering, you know. Um, you know, as as I was I was reading Ben's book, I was thinking. Why? I mean, that's what I said. Uh, you know, even spirituality is not cannot soften this suffering that you know we all witnessing today. You know, is um, is excessive. You know, I mean, it it, it makes you think of of uh, ending it. You know, is is um, yeah. So I I think I think it was already there. You know the. Goodbye. I mean, the global war was already there, you know, the way, <clears throat> the way, I mean, when she says, you know, j'ai honte de mon pays, you know, I'm, 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 a, I'm ashamed of my country because my country participated in this global enterprise of, of, of losing bodies just as commodity, you know, so, yeah, I mean, I think, yeah. yeah. The other mm. um, the new new problems for consciousness, new challenges amidst society of the spectacle. You know, I think uh, I'll just tell it in a story about last year when I was here to return to Edward Said's archive. I met a person uh, out on Broadway who was trying to get a statue of Paul Robeson on campus. Mm -hmm. Did did it was it built? Is, anyone, is there a statue? That person still out there, you know. And we had a conversation, and this person said, and I kind of nodded in agreement. You know, we don't quite have people like Paul Robeson anymore. <laughs> and I think in our time where academics or whoever you know, um, uh, people with platforms might end up trying to sell something more or less to us, you know, uh, become part of some kind of brand or some kind of ambassador. They is a, a sort of corrective who would have been deeply suspicious of that, tying ourselves, tying your platform, tying your prestigious education, tying your voice or fame or infamy to the world of the spectacle, as opposed to like Paul Robeson, you know, giving, actually having to give up things, lose things <laughs> in the solidarity, like your passport. Uh, um, so uh, not the self-help neoliberal ethic to summarize it. I find that helpful. And to the uh, second question, you know, she capitalized the state in her writing. Mm -hmm. And she said about words with capital letters, if you put all of them together, and squeeze them, they would just run with blood because of the way we sacrifice people, life, for these ideas we um, promote, like the state. That'd be any state for her. Uh, you, you know, the, and then the globalization point, I think, also to your question, her ethics of attention but sometimes missed in the translation is the emphasis on waiting. You know, that's more clear. You know, uh, and uh, she did think there was a sort of ethical dimension that like two day shipping is not a good habit to get into in terms of creating selves that can respond to others and pursue the difficult cooperation uh, over time. So that seems also relevant to the society of 
uh, the spectacle of globalized state capitalism moment we're living. Uh, thanks. Um, yeah, I'll just add a few. I'll just add a few things before we take another round. So prepare to raise your hand. Yeah, okay. See Max, and then we'll get some more. But um, all right. So, uh, you know, I I I I was also very much taken by uh, what's called the Journal de Spain, which is a short, so a short moleskin that she wrote while she was in Spain. And um, and very surprised by it, um, very surprised, particularly for a pacifist, uh, because um, there's just these passages. It's 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 very short. It's only like it's only like twenty four uh, folio pages. I think they were saying in in here. She's given a weapon, and but she she seems somewhat taken by it. Um, there's this passage, uh, uh, Carpentier, Ridel, Roana, c'est lui qui a tué B. He's the one who killed B, parenthesis. Bon travail, point exclamation. Um, so good work, you know, exclamation point. I mean, there's, it's actually, she was able, she, it's, the text is somewhat, um, is very engaged in uh it's not only the capitalized words that are going to bleed blood um there's a lot in this text actually that's going to bleed blood i mean there's a, there's there's real there's the kind of vengeance to kill fascists in this short little in this short little journal that reminds you of reading uh, George Orwell's um, Homage to Catalonia uh, or, you know, certain passages of uh, Hemingway's For Whom the Bell Tolls, which which I kind of, which I, so as, 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 as uh, that was odd. That was odd for a pacifist, I thought. I mean, but, but anyway, it really does. And again, I'm not that interested in biographies. I'm interested in kind of like the words in the text or at least like taking philosophically seriously but but there was there was a lot there um uh so to, so to come back to parker your point um so i take it this has been bothering you for two weeks now you've been totally obsessed by it right Why don't we pass the why don't we pass the mic to, to sorry just because actually for the recording so go ahead we hear you well here but maybe so on the I, it, so I mean it was uh, the first thing I read was uh, Ben Davis's well I didn't read all of it I read the first I, I finished it but I at, when I first started I read uh, started reading Ben Davis's book and then I was like now I need to read Simone Vey now I got a little obsessed and I read A Need for Roots uh, it took me a while to get through it but I got through it. And what stuck with me the most was, I mean, there's a lot, that, there's a lot that I can go on, but for this specifically, um, she talks about like the cause of uprootedness. Well, two of the causes like money and conquest and the people who go out and do the conquest, the people who are uprooted. And she references the adventurers, uh, the English and the Spanish adventurers, the, the, and when I read that, I read that as she's talking about the leaders, like the people leading those kind of um conquests um where i'm kind of stuck and where i want to like kind of turn like at least i'm curious on what like experts of simone ve people who understand her work much better than i do might see if it's possible to instead of using this uprootedness to think about how the workers because she talks about how it's necessary for an exploitive state the capitalist state to uproot the workers to extract as much value from them as they can. Mm -hmm. And by rerouting themselves, I mean, if we're like talking about winners and losers, this kind of exploitive system loses. And my kind of thought process is when we look at the need to uproot these, we have to, as an exploitive capitalist state, have to exploit, or excuse me, we have to uproot those workers to get them to do what we need them to do. 
is that not the same case with the workers who are the ones that make state oppression and state violence possible? So I think into the extent, and I'm not intending here to give leeway to um, soldiers or police officers or like it kind of excuse any misdeeds. But what I am curious is if there is an active act of uprootedness and we have to not we, but an exploitive system has to uproot them in order to get them what to do what they need to do. That same thing is also, I would say, happening with the people who are the ones on the front lines who are then going out and colonizing and exploiting and oppressing. Yeah. yeah. And so if the goal of Simone Vey is to reroute the workers and we're seeing issues with that, like we've been talking about, like what are the issues and the inabilities to do that today? Is there not like a value to thinking about how to re reroute the individuals, not in the factories, not in the modes of production, but in the like, I don't even know what to call them, but the members of the bureaucracy, the armed forces, the police forces who are making it possible for the system to exploit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I that's a great question. And, um, I'm not sure how to answer it, except that my mind goes here. That maybe the you, as in the military, are are not so much the one who is exploiting as just you are the factory worker in a way. You are cre it's, you, you are creating the little you are. I mean, and that's where you started, right? It felt like it's exactly like being in the factory, but actually, maybe it is, right? In the sense that you don't even know necessarily what your work is doing in the same way in which, I mean, to be brutal here, I mean, uh, you know Lenin's critique of imperialism, or or a critique of uh, the First World War, right? I mean, uh, would have been that actually you, or, uh, actually the the soldiers in the First World War who were so who themselves felt so much that they were fighting for French, for the French nation, or for the German nation. And my, you know, my my grandfather was in Verdun you know, for years in these trenches, whatever, but had some notion that they were fighting for France, right? Well, actually, that's not maybe what was going on, right? It was imperialism. It was, you know, wealthy, wealthy imperialists and this, right? Now, in, this, in the same way in which the factory worker has no concept or maybe does, I don't know, at least... <laughs> Weil was suggesting that the factory worker didn't understand what, you know, what the boulon was going to be used for. Right? It's almost as if maybe the, the person in the trenches doesn't really understand what they're being used for. Right. Or something like that. I mean, and so I'm, I'm, this is not vile. This is me thinking. Right. Um, In which case, right, there would be, there would still be another class somehow that is, that is, in, that is intentional and knowing. Um, but it's not actually the folk. I mean, you could, you could ask that question about the war in Iraq, right? Or in Afghanistan, right? I mean, and our, and our friends and others who were deployed to Afghanistan, right? And maybe, you know, had a completely different conception of what was going on and why they were there and what they were doing than perhaps what the war in Afghanistan was really about. So I don't know if there's that disconnect. And it almost makes it as if military service really does become like the factory here. Um, uh, but I'm not sure then that, I mean, and, and what was bothering you, Parker, I think was, well, maybe we need to be working on them 
in the military, right? Maybe maybe it's that, but as, as, as right. Well, but I think you were thinking about it as working on what is causing or what is causing all of this. Um, but actually, it might be that in the military, you're not the 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 the, the soldier, the even the officer, right? Is not is not is much more like the factory worker than the manager is what I'm suggesting. I don't know. I don't know. But I think it's fascinating, fascinating question. And um, I did want to get back to Dorothea. I think we did cover globalization somewhat. But um, so this, that, 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 that's also a terrific question. In, in, in a way, I think Ben was going there when he was suggesting that the equivalent today would be to go work in the gig economy. Right, um, so that would be that would be that would be somehow some 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 equivalent to thinking about it. I, I, and I. How can we still use vile? You were asking, right? Uh, I mean, it depends what we're doing with the text. Right? I mean, there are methodological issues such as the one that I was suggesting about like an immersive philosophical praxis. And that seems still applicable, um, even if the conditions would be so entirely different. Um, and thinking about one's relationship to labor, thinking about these questions of autonomy uh, that are so important uh, to Simon Weil, I think those would still be uh, relevant. And so, so I think there's, yeah, but I, I think you're right that we'd have to reimagine uh, how it plays out. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay, good. So I've got Max, Arjun, and Oscar, and Daria. And maybe that'll be the last round. Max, you want to take that mic right there? Um, thank you for all you've said so far. I really have appreciated it. Wanted to put two things on the table. One was, um, I was thinking a lot about artificial intelligence um, in reading her work and um, sort of thinking of it as a distillation or the essential essence of what she found offensive about bureaucracy and the collective and sort of the centralizing aspect of AI. Um, curious if you can, can expound on that a little bit. And then um, the other thing is um, there have been a couple comments about um, eating is killing, and um, why can't we live like plants, um, photosynthesize? And I'm curious about her, uh, the, the extent to which she thought about non-human life, and um, perhaps thinking about the um, uh, immersive philosophical pract praxis aspect of her life, um, how that might apply to the non-human, where there's always an aspect of the imaginative where we can't um, experience what they experience. Um, so yeah, that's what I have. Thanks, Max. Arjun? Yeah, Ben, you were speaking about the negative power and the negative force. So the absolution of the main character force. And so I'm interested in if negation can occur without a fatalistic attitude or anarchy, which we've discussed in multiple sessions um, throughout cooperism. Um, and so is, is there, um, and especially in the struggle for theory and practice um, in finding their directions and their relations, um, what's an example of how, what's an example in the world of how negation is constructive and generative but not fatalistic and and anarchic and that's just this like the gen the possibility of a generative process related to negation how do we disinherit the world from the world how how do we create our imaginative workplace where as um where you know we attend to loving our neighbors like you had mentioned in the beginning of your um, remarks and where the salvation of our soul can be 
distilled in that workplace and crystallized into the contracts. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Daria, and then Oscar. Uh, just flip it up. There we go. Um, this is a very, is a much less uh, evolved question, I guess. I'm not a really expert in this, um, but I have read like feminist Marxism, Marxist theory, and I read a lot of Kant in college. Um, and I'm curious about if there are other theorists who bring this Kantian moral lens to Marx and what you think of bringing these like moral value judgments, um, sometimes even religious judgments to a Marxist analysis. Super, thanks, Daria. Oscar? Is this working? It's working? Okay. So I think we could bring the conversation back briefly to Bay's conception of education. Um, there's a quote that a professor of mine reads every year around finals that uh, intelligence is led by desire and that uh, without the joy of learning, there are no students but poor characters of apprentices who at the end of their study will not even have a trade. Um, this, of course, I think brings us back to a theme in our conversation of the sort of numbing effect of factory work and the sort of lack of an education in the factory and that specific type of work. Um, as far as I understand, Bayes suggests that the two ways of achieving desire are through the sort of dissolution of the self into the, the sort of decreation and then the finding of a connection to God or the sort of the, the pure intuition and connection to God. But I was sort of curious how, um, if they ever suggest that desire can be generated in a connection to another person on a sort of individual basis or a sort of in a collective closer to like what Martin Buber suggests. Um, and my second question is um, if they ever sort of connects or injects this sort of desire in learning to her educational practice and her teaching. Thank you. Great, thanks. All right, so we've got a few questions and I think maybe we could use this kind of final response opportunity as a way to give some concluding thoughts. So maybe kind of weaving in some responses, but also wrapping up and proposing some final thoughts. Ben, do you want to start? OK. Um, I'll just take the questions and then see if I have speaking, you know, anything else to uh, add. So. AI, you know, they had this idea of writing as waiting for the right word. And you're supposed to not write down any of the wrong words that are not precise enough. Um, and, you know, it's interesting because you meant the, some of the people you mentioned, this Spanish Civil War ge generation in writing, Hemingway, Orwell, Bay, there's a certain clarity to the sentences. Mm -hmm that I feel we've somewhat lost, to say the least. Uh, in any case, so this is where I think of AI. Um, it, it certainly wouldn't allow for that practice, practice of self, ethical practice. Um, and, and to your other question, uh, there's a lot in Bay and non-human life. Uh, Beatrice Marovich has written something about this. One of the of the many joys of thinking with uh, Frida for a while now is I'm starting to learn to read a little better. And, uh, you know, you'd have to, it might not be explicit to be there in the notebooks, mm -hmm. but in some of the other stuff, it might not be as explicit. But as Frida has taught me, that's, you know, still something we have to read for. Uh, it might be with respect to the uh, grapes or time in the vineyards. Um, and then there are other questions that might be less satisfying, which has to do with her relationship to Plato uh, and how animality fits in there. The great beast that I briefly mentioned with respect to collectivity and um, cooperism being something we'd have to tarry with. 
this is the thing with Vey, you know, we were talking about with the the line you, you read, Bernard, from her time in Spain, where we say these things like, wouldn't it be nice to read these philosophers' journals? Or wouldn't it be nice if a thinker really tarried with these contradictions? And then you go look at it. <laughs> it's like, okay, I'm not sure these were the contradictions I was hoping for. The, you know, good job to her violent colleague as you you know you have to erase uh bay was a pacifist okay now footnote uh except this one time in spain uh when she was celebrating that so yeah um Kant and marx i think you know there hasn't been enough written on bay and walter benjamin specifically on violence that would make for a very interesting work um they on force benjamin's uh critique of violence that that could be good uh Negation, productive negation. I think to go back to the society of spectacle question, part of that spectacle is violence. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I was uh, a number of weeks ago, maybe around October 10th, I was um, playing tennis with my tennis partner. And who's uh, um, interested in, he's a psychiatrist who's also a, a psychoanalyst. And he said, you know, the people who had PTSD after 9-11 watched the videos over and over. I've been thinking of this in our time where you go to the New York Times and it's a video now, the front page, you know, if it's online. And um, how to say it? I want to be careful because I think People rejected Vey as mentally ill mm -hmm. instead of dwelling with her claims that were uncomfortable for French society. Mm -hmm. So to your point, you know, eh, if you read the writings on colonialism, which I'd be interested in your thoughts on. I read her, she says things like, we are barbarous, the French, as French people, mm -hmm. and the French left. So it wasn't just, I find this interesting, like um, soldiers sometimes, or even police officers sometimes have uh, some reflections. And they was pressing not just the rest of society who just, we go around to our shopping, whatever we do, but also intellectuals who critique those soldiers, <laughs> see what I mean? And who critique the police officers and think that they're not implicated in the same colonial racist forces but oh it's the police officer but i'm a leftist intellectual at the cafe not part of colonialism so she presses everybody or the universal returns uh um that i find productive or helpful reminder um okay and education and desire Well, because Plato was so important to they, you know, there is that erotic element that I mean, some in the etymological sense, really, you know, of uh, education draws things out in us, beauty of others draws things out in us or draws us to another self. Um, trying to avoid biography deliberately. So, um, you also mentioned Martin Buber. A lot of they people, you know, are some read Buber also, and this get a kind of eye and thou from they. I think that's a fair reading. Um, so I'll just say at the end, you know, one of the reasons I wanted to emphasize friendship as a theme, which I think is related to this, uh, it is. Uh, partly, I also agree with your reading that there is an individualism. There is a certain, you know, she um, was not baptized. She didn't join the church. She lived on these kind of thresholds of, uh, well, the baptism question, this was recorded. I'm going to get emails about that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so she tarried with, she tarried with whether or not to get baptized. <laughs> okay, and uh, whether, in other words, as an individual to involve herself in any kind of 
something like the church, even though she desired the sacraments greatly. Mm -hmm. Go back to desire. Um, and I think there is a way if we read Vey's personal struggles, she's, you know, she struggled with herself so deeply. Every aspect, her identity of all these things. Uh, um, we can be left in, a, in an absolute sort of despairing fatigue, these themes brought up particularly in the factory. And the if the antidote to that is not in something like revolution that she was worried about because she thought kind of geometrically and physically like physics and thought of revolution as like the lighter side of a scale going down. In other words, it wasn't going to happen. That's not how force works. So then we can be left with um, not a lot of options, uh, to say the least. So particularly if we're skeptical of collectivity, if we place ourselves on the thresholds, I don't quite fit in in this place or whatever it is. So one, mm, uh, I'm not going to say antidote, uh, suggestion she puts forth that you know runs through the history of philosophy um, returns to the question of thinking with others as um, psychologically important not just in our contemporary sense but in the suke you know breath soul it feeds us that way and could perhaps be essential to the political movement or the cooper cooperism um, that we so desperately need, um, even if it doesn't answer the more specific what to do questions. Mm -hmm. Frida? Well, I think, I think, uh... I think when you, you have given us the, the the conclusion of what to do, I mean, what to, yeah, what to do, the question of what to do, what you know, how, and, and um, I think, you know, they, when the question of individualism, I mean, she, as she was thinking, she was thinking about, she put herself in the center of all of us together and i think um the the individual did not really exist that's why she wanted to erase herself from it because i mean she was in the what, what i read earlier you 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 know you know when she's talking about the neighbor is like that's a question you can't even ask somebody today. What are you going through? You cannot, you know? So I think I think she was, I don't even know how to put it. You, 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 you know, she was, she was already somewhere else that you cannot imagine that thing. Yeah, what to do. I think that's uh, to some of, you know, some of these questions. I mean, you know, she was in a space. When I, when I read that piece, I was like, gee, you know, waiting, you know, the Lacan, the way, you know, the, the, the anguish, the suffering, it was, it was too excessive. So, yeah, what to do? I don't know. I mean, every time I read the piece from her, I'm like, well, what to do? What, you know, how to stop? well um good well that will give us more um fuel for next week and um and for our seminars next next uh, next semester i think um so i um well just one final thought maybe because i I I don't know I, if certainly I I can't answer that that question and that right but but there's something about 
Simone Weil's writing and resistance to being told what to do, right? That means that somehow the answer is going to have, it seems to me, the answer is going to have to come from within ourselves, right? In a way that um, that is remarkable. And that is one of the most remarkable things about her work. It's tied to this suspicion of collectivity. It's tied to the resistance to parties. It's tied to resistance to dogma. Um, and it's and it's about a remarkable fortitude of self reflection in part which is i think her conception of autonomy and liberty but um but so i think that um maybe what she helps us with at the end of the day is this question of actually not seeking answers elsewhere or uh, from uh, from others, but kind of a form of introspection um, through immersive philosophical praxis that is truly um, inspiring. So um, please join me in thanking uh, Ben Davis and Frida Ecoto for a rich conversation that was really that was really. Uh, I really enjoyed that conversation and and learned a lot and also um, was challenged in many ways. So I really appreciate it. Thank you all for coming out and for your great questions. Thank you to Kiana Takavi for organizing this session and getting us all here and uh, so beautifully. Thank you, Reno, for the AV production. Um, thank you all. And uh, the next time uh, we're gonna meet next week, uh, we're going, we've got an, another extraordinary panel. It's going to be on the Frankfurt School and uh, questions of uh, capitalism, critiques of capitalism um, in a similar time frame, similar time period in response to Nazi, to national socialism. So it's really the debate, the state of the debate over the state. Um, and we've got an, a terrific uh, panel with Jens Meyer Hendrik, who actually is editing the Frankel work, the Ernst Frankel work, the dual state, um, and is a complete expert on this, as well as Clara Meyer, uh, who's an expert on that, and also on the on the Weimar Republic, and uh, Bill Scheuermann, uh, who's written a really important book on the Frankfurt School. So that's going to be next uh, next Wednesday, and uh, look forward to that. And then please join us. We're going to cross the street. I was thinking that it would be nice to go right down the street from Simon Viles apartment building. Does anybody live? Does anybody live in the building? 549 Riverside Drive? No, it's graduate housing. Anyway, because there is a pub right down uh, where her house is, her apartment was, but it's going to be easier to just cross the street. So please join us and our panelists for more conversation uh, at, uh, at Arts and Crafts across the street. Okay, take care.